What's up my stats stars? In this video, I'm going to walk through the 2024 AP Statistics free response question number six. It is a very long question, but I think a really, really easy question that I hope you did well and hope going through this video, it's going to prove that you actually did well on it. So the question all starts with this. A company sells a certain type of whistle. The price of the whistle varies from store to store. Julio is a statistician at the company, wants to estimate the mean price in dollars of this type of whistle at all stores that sell the whistle. All right, first question says, identify the appropriate procedure that he, or inference procedure that Julio would use and describe the parameter for the inference procedure you identified in part A, comma one. Now, first, he wants to find the mean price. And if you're trying to find a mean price, you have no idea what it is, you're gonna conduct a one sample T interval for the mean price in dollars of this type of whistle at all stores that sell the whistle being needed. Now. Here's the idea. Why am I gonna use a T interval? Because he's only gonna be working with a sample and that's all he knows. All he's gonna know is the mean of his sample and the standard deviation of his sample and therefore he's gonna to have to use a T interval because if the only standard deviation you know is out of your sample, you're gonna need a T interval. All right, and then again, don't forget the context. Hopefully you didn't just write one sample T interval. You gotta make sure you write the context. It's a one sample T interval for the mean price in dollars of this type of whistle sold at all stores. Now, Describe the parameter. Well, the parameter is simply the true mean that he's looking for. This, the parameter would be mu, the true population mean price in dollars of this type of whistle at all stores that sell the whistle would be needed. Again, that's what he's looking for. He's looking for that true mu. That is the population parameter that he is after for his inference procedure. So hopefully that wasn't too bad of a problem. Now then, he actually goes and gets a sample of 20 randomly selected stores. He calls those stores and determines what is the price of the whistle at that store. And he makes a dot plot of those 20 prices from those 20 stores. And we even have the summary statistics, uh, mean, standard deviation, and the five number summary for that data. All right, the first question says, describe the shape of the distribution of the sample of whistle prices. Justify response using appropriate values from the summary statistic table. So the first thing I said was the shape of the distribution of the prices of whistles is skewed to the right. That's what my eyes saw. But I need to back that up with some, like they said, some values from the summary statistic. So I said I can see this first by looking at the dot plot and seeing that there's more prices to the lower end and less prices less and less prices at least to the higher end, showing that skewed right. I also noticed that the mean was higher than the median. When your mean is higher than the median, that is another sign that you're gonna be skewed to the right. Because when you're skewed to the right, the mean's gonna get pulled towards the right and hence be higher than the median. If you look at that summary statistics table, you clearly see that the mean is bigger than the median. Lastly, the third quartile being further from the median than the first quartile is, is another indicator that our data is more spread out to the right-hand side. Again, if you actually look at the data, the distance between the median and the third quartile is longer or, or more spread apart than the distance between the first quartile and the median. Again, that's another sign that our data is skewed to the right. So they really wanted us to make sure that we use appropriate values from that table to explain this, not just saying, hey, it looks skewed right. And that's where we're here. The biggest one is showing that the mean is gonna be higher than the median. Next up, they say use the 1.5 times the IQR rule to determine whether there are any outliers in the sample of whistle prices, justify your response. So again, to determine if there's any outliers, hopefully everybody knows that this is called the fence method. So we have an upper fence and the upper fence is gonna be taking Q3, 5.475 adding 1.5 times the IQR. So we do need to briefly figure out what that IQR is. The IQR is simply gonna be taking 5.475, that's Q3, minus Q1, 4.51. And that is not very difficult math to do, but grab a calculator because the last thing you wanna do is mess, that, mess up that math and get something wrong. But that IQR is 0.965. So that's how we're gonna find our upper fence and then we wanna make sure we talk about that anything above that upper fence would be deemed an outlier. Now we don't have all the data, but we actually can go and look at that dot plot, but we also have the max as well. Then we're gonna do the same thing with the lower fence. The lower fence is gonna be taking 4.51 Q1, subtract 1.5 times 0.965 the IQR and any value below that and so we can look in our dot plot to see if there's any value below that lower fence that would be deemed an outlier. We also have the min that can help us understand as well. So here is all my work for that. I actually went ahead and showed the work. I got a lower fence of 3.0625. And if we look at our min, 
there is the min is 4.25. So obviously there's nothing below 3.0625 if our min is at 4.25. So we have no lower outliers. And then our upper fence is at 6.9225. Our max is at 6.58. So if our max is at 6.58, then obviously there's no data above 6.9. So basically, both the max and the min are within our fences, hence there are no outliers in this data according to the 1.5 times the IQR rule. Nice and simple, pretty easy so far. All right, then we get this whole new idea. They explain that oftentimes it can be difficult to determine if the distribution is skewed just by looking at the graph and the summary statistics. Now, in our data, we made our conclusion, I think it's skewed to the right, but sometimes it can be a little bit fuzzy. So. Statisticians sometimes measure how skewed data is, and one way they can measure it is what's called the Pearson's coefficient of skewness. Now, it's calculated using a really simple formula, it's some formula you've never heard, but this is exactly what question six loves to do, is present you with something brand new. So Pearson's coefficient is simply taking three times your sample mean minus your sample median, all divided by the standard deviation of S. And all they want us to do is calculate Pearson's coefficient based on these 20 whistles. So I'm gonna have to go back and use my summary statistics table that they gave me and just start filling everything in. The mean is 5.12, it said that right here. The median is 4.885, it said that right here. And the standard deviation is 7.43, there it is. So I just gotta to go to my calculator, literally type in exactly what I see there, three times 5.12 minus 4.885, divided by 7.43, and I get my Pearson coefficient of 0.9489. Now, how does that number tell me if my data is skewed or not? Well, that's what they talk about next. So next up, they show you one of these, this, this graph, and they basically say that you need to plot your Pearson coefficient along with your sample size, and then you can determine where you fall, and if you fall into that shaded region, your data is considered approximately symmetric. If you fall on the left, you're strongly skewed to the left, and if you fall to the right, you're strongly skewed to the right. So this question literally just said, put an X where our Pearson coefficient was. So remember, the first thing is our sample size is 20, so we're gonna go right down to the 20, and our Pearson coefficient was about point, you know, go back, it was a 0.9489, so I put it right around here. Obviously, you know, get out a magnifying glass, maybe it should be a little bit higher, but obviously this is 0.8 and here's one, so 0.9 would be right about here. So 0.95-ish, you know, right about where I put my X on that line for 20. So again, that's where our Pearson coefficient fell, and it's in that region, that white region over there, that is saying our data is strongly skewed. And that's exactly what the next question asks. What would you conclude about the shape of the distribution of the sample of whistles? Justify your response. Well, based on the area where our Pearson coefficient lies, the distribution of the sample of whistle prices is strongly skewed to the right. Notice how I answered their question with context. I even mentioned whistle prices again. You always want to use context when you give these answers, especially for full credit. And then I even added more. The X I placed on the chart falls in the area labeled strongly skewed, and being on the right-hand side, I assume that that means it was strongly skewed to the right, which we kind of already saw in the dot plot as well. But again, over-explain yourself, right? Like, don't, don't say things that aren't true, obviously, but don't just give simple answers like, oh, that's where the X was. You know what I mean? Explain it in context, and I think that this answer I have here is a pretty good explanation of that. All right, and then there's one more part. Again, number six here wasn't too bad, just there's lots of parts to kind of go through here. The last part says Julio's inference procedure in part AI needs one of the following requirements to be satisfied. Now, you guys should know this. To do that T interval, we have to make sure that we fit this big enough condition or this normality condition. We need to be big enough to be normal. And uh, there's kind of a couple rules here. The first rule is that our sample size is greater than or equal to 30, which our sample size is only 20, so we don't pass that. Or if the sample size is less than 30, the distribution of the sample does not or is not strongly skewed and does not have outliers. So using our response from the previous questions and the preceding requirements, is the normality condition satisfied for Julio's data? Well, I said no. The normality condition is not satisfied. Again, notice I answered their question with their question. Don't just say no. First, I said the sample is not greater than 30. So unfortunately, we do not meet this first condition right here where would that be nice and simple. I wrote the sample size of 20 whistles is less than 30 and we have concluded based on our observations of the dot plot and more so based on this new Pearson coefficient that the sample data is strongly skewed. 
So unfortunately, we don't meet that second possible way that we can meet normality either. The condition states if our sample is less than 30, it need not have outliers. Now, we did confirm that. We did check our data and we did not find any outliers using our 1.5 times the IQR rule. But it says and. It's got to be both no outliers and not strongly skewed. And since we did say our data is strongly skewed by looking at it, and by looking at that Pearson coefficient, since our sample did not meet this condition, we do not satisfy the normality condition. And there it is. What a really easy number six, uh, perhaps one of the easiest ones I've seen. It's just long and it's wordy. And if you just look at it without reading anything, you might be like, oh my God, this question is impossible. Especially if you look at this graph, you're like, I've never seen a graph like this in my life. Well, if you just take your time to read through the question and answer it one at a time, it's actually quite easy and not overly difficult. So hopefully based on watching this video, you feel really good about getting a, you know at least two, maybe even three, and hopefully four points on this FRQ. But I thought it was a pretty easy one for the 2024 AP Statistics exam. All right, see you guys in the next video. Hope you did great on the test.